Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you back in our seminar room, our heart and soul of the Summer Fellowship and the Institutes. I'm Mark Gottlieb, Senior Director at the Tikva Fund, and we're here to host this afternoon's conversation on debates in Jewish theology. Rabbi Elliot Cosgrove, a colleague of ours and someone that you'll all see, or most of you will see, uh, next week in conversation with Eric Cohen on the future of American Judaism, published a, a small provocative piece about seven years ago entitled, Where Have All the Theologians Gone? And the thesis of this piece was that in the 50s and 60s and 70s, America saw a renaissance of public theology. Will Herberg, Arthur Cohen, Neil Fackenheim, Eliezer Berkowitz, Abraham Joshua Heschel, by Joseph Soloveitchik. These were names that became commonplace in the canon of contemporary Jewish thought. And that by contrast, our era is bereft is lost, it's a dor yitomim, an orphaned generation when it comes to the public discourse around Jewish theology. And he challenges his readers in the opening lines of this little piece to name five Jewish theologians that are contributing something of worth to contemporary Jewish thought that have written a book after that have written a major book after 1990. Well, in our room today, I think by anybody's lists, we'd find the two individuals sitting to my left. Part of what we have to understand <coughs> is why this exercise is actually so hard. Why is it that there are so few theologians? And, and that'll be something which we'll try to take up in today's conversation. But thankfully, we have a couple of theologians in the house today. And I'm delighted to be able to welcome genuine friends and colleagues who, uh, who have made a mark already in their young lives and uh, are mensches about it. Um, to my immediate left is uh, Rabbi Dr. Shai Held. Rabbi Held is the co-founder and dean of Jewish thought at Mahon Hadar here in the Upper West Side. Uh, he is known for his deep empathy and, and scholarship, especially on the topic of Abraham Joshua Heschel, who I think will have occasion to to invoke once or twice today. Uh, he just celebrated the publication of his first book, um, Abraham Joshua Heschel, The Call of Transcendence, Indiana University Press, and congratulations on that. Uh, seated to Rabbi Held's left is Rabbi Dr. Mayor Salvechik, the dean of the Strauss Center for Torah and Western Values at Yeshiva University. Uh, rabbi Salvechik um, is also the senior rabbi at Congregation Sherit Israel, the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue. He'll tell you exactly how many years it's been since... Since I became Sephardic, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, rabbi Salvechik completed a, a, a doctorate um, at Princeton University on the theology of Michael Wishagrad. We'll likely make an appearance this afternoon. Um, and uh, it's great to see both of you here today with us at Tikva. And I guess I would take up that, that claim that Cosgrove makes that we really lost the discourse of Jewish theology, or for the most part, it's, it's in steep, rapid decline. Would you agree with this assessment? If so, why, and if not, why not? 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's a great pleasure to have Mayor Soloveitchik to my left, which is rare. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Slow crowd, but a good one. <laughs> That's the uh, best crowd. Um, yeah, I think, sadly, um, we are not at a moment in which Jewish theology is in decline in America. I think we're in a moment where Jewish theology has all but disappeared. And it is a really interesting question why that is. I would say two broad things. Um, one is that, in some ways, I think we still feel the effects of how much, Jew how much Jews felt they stood to gain from the notion of a secular society. Jews, in many ways, are the last great cheerleaders for that project. Um, Jews bought into a certain kind of secularization project, the fantasy of a neutral society, um, very, very deeply, and in some ways, um, that process continues. I want to say about that. I want to say that very briefly. And I want to say something else I think is much, in some ways, much more fundamental. There was a moment in American Jewish thought when there was a discipline that people referred to as post-Holocaust theology. And post-Holocaust theology was not a chronological designation so much as a kind of almost conceptual designation. It was a set of theological writings which tried to confront the question of the Shoah. And in particular, obviously, the questions of theodicy and whether and in what way one could go on talking about a god of history. And what's really striking is that conversation came to an all but total end. But I have come to think in the last few years that the reason it came to an end is not, and certainly not just, because the questions grew less urgent for many people. The conversation came to an end because for most American Jews, the questions won. For most American Jews, the questions, one, that is to say, just how can we go on talking <coughs> in traditional terms about a God who cares, um, about a God who in some way is sovereign, who rules the world? In many ways, those questions, I think, overtook a lot of American Jewish life. Um, all of these things, obviously, we could unpack at greater length, but I'm just going to um, say that in shorthand. That is the same reason, I suspect, why almost all of the Buddhist leadership in America are Jews. Because it became a location. I, I always say that my fantasy is to gather all of the great Buddhist meditation teachers in America into a room and then just say Barhu and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It is really astonishing. We have to a who's who of Buddhist meditation teachers in America. They're not only Jews, they all have names out of a Jewish central casting, like Rosenberg, Cornfield. They're all, it's, they're amazing. They're all Jews. Now, I think part of the reason for that is there remained a really profound spiritual hunger. And Buddhism, certainly in its American forms, allowed the conversation of God to be totally evaded. Right? You could find a kind of spiritual practice, a spiritual connection. And the question of how do we talk about God could be totally bracketed or made irrelevant. Right? Here was a conversation where you didn't have to um, engage that question, because that question is simply not part of the discourse. Um, I would also say, I think that a culture, sort of, I guess, part three of an answer, a culture that has swallowed consumerism and all it represents whole, um, whole is a culture where an actual opening to the transcendent is very difficult to talk about. Um, I talk a lot about different economic systems and the impact they have on religion, but I think you know one of the things that happens is in a culture that I'll use these terms advisedly, worships success, there are spiritual and theological consequences as well. Um, I think the lack of theology in different communities comes from slightly different reasons. In, to the extent that denominational labels are still useful, in the reform and conservative world, the lack of theology um, is in part because those communities have been all but totally secularized. Um, in, the Orthodox world, in a really interesting way, and I, something that I, it took me a, some time to figure out based on my own experience and then over the years in conversations with students, <laughs> is a realization that Orthodoxy is at least as atheological as any other conversation in America. Atheological is not atheistic, right? Although there's that too. You can't live on the Upper West Side long enough without realizing it's also an atheist Orthodoxy as well. <laughs> orthodoxy becomes a kind of ethnic practice. But there is very much profound atheology in American Orthodoxy. Halakha becomes the only discourse. Um, 
where questions of what's true really in the end get marginalized. Now, part of that is for the same reasons, the doubts that we talked about. Part of it, I think, also an added dilemma that orthodoxy in America faces is what I would call a kind of chilling effect. Um, the fear of saying anything that's going to get you in trouble makes it very hard to do theology. I mean, in some ways, I think the Orthodox rabbinate still feels the effect of, let's call it, the Rabbi Yitz Greenberg years, where the sort of feeling of, I don't want to be written out, and that's become much worse in the age of blogging. Um, so I think that there's another dimension to why theology and orthodoxy is you know, in its own struggle. Now, just before I hand over the floor to, to call you Rabbi, Sol Rabbi de Soloveitchik. Um, minister. Minister, yeah. uh, minister de Soloveitchik. Um, <laughs> there's a tremendous cost to this. Um, not least is, and here I'm going to say something that is totally obvious, but I think it's important to say, that it leaves the Jewish community We'll say it this way, and I don't mean this as fiction, so please don't mishear this. Inheriting a novel in which it goes on talking as if the main character in that novel is simply irrelevant. That is, to refuse a conversation about theology is to basically refuse to engage with the main character of the story in which you aspire to be a participant. That seems to me to be a project that has a real dead end built into it. I don't think that actually makes sense or is sustainable at the end. There's a lot more I could say, but you go ahead. Well, I actually ag agree with uh, a lot of what I've held. Then I take uh, it all back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I would phrase it. Say that now. Before yeah, things. Exactly. Um, uh, I would phrase it slightly differently, and perhaps the nuances and the differences are important. Uh, I do agree uh, with Rabbi Held that much of the uh, American Jewish project has been the secularizing of the public square. And uh, the notion that faith uh, should have something important to say about the public affairs of the day or the matters of the day, taken for granted on both the right and the left in the 50s and 60s, has now been rejected on the left um, and by and large by Jews. Uh, I think um, we are a society that uh, plays with hedonism at times. Um, both within the religious community and not within the religious community. There is the uh, danger as well of what Ravar and Lichtsen has called uh, glot kosher hedonism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now we're in the nine days, um, and uh, every fancy restaurant in New York has come out with a special nine days menu. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think this is true. I mean, I don't think this is just apocryphal. But a couple of years ago, there was a restaurant that published their nine days menu, their kosher nine days menu in the Jewish week or wherever, and it said in the headline for their ad, now you can enjoy the nine days. <laughs> um, so and whether that's true or not, it, it has the ring of truth, or it's what we, we in the rabbinate, the pulpit rabbinate, not theology, but in the pulpit rabbinate called too good to check. Um, uh, but, uh, um, but that said, it has the ring of truth to it, and that's certainly a part of our society. But, but really, the larger question is not why the Jewish community is not producing theologians, but rather, and everybody helped touch on this too, why aren't the seminaries, the, the ones whose students have already volunteered for spiritual vocations, to go into the rabbinate, to go into Torah or Judaism-related professions, why aren't the seminaries producing theologians, right? Because many of the great theologians of the 50s, 60s, the ones that you mentioned, uh, in, in Rabbi Krasgo's brief, whether they were Jewish or whether they were Christian, um, uh, were affiliated with seminaries. That's certainly true among many, most of the Jews that were mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the major Christian theologians of the age as well, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, or well, brother H. Richard Niebuhr, otherwise known as the better Niebuhr, um, is, um, they were all affiliated with seminaries. So these are, why aren't the seminaries now producing it? And, and here I think, I would also agree with what Rabbi Held said, but I would phrase it a, a little differently. Uh, on the Orthodox side, um, the focus has, has, has been, certainly on most of Orthodoxy, uh, the focus has been on halakha. Um, but I don't think that that's atheological. Um, it, it's something slightly different. Um, I think it was a David Galerter who said, in talking about the need to produce Jewish writers of ideas, who said that originally Jews wanted to be Jewish, and they would say, I want to be Jewish, but I don't know how, tell me. And that's why we have the codes of law, Shulchan Aruch, etc. He says, now, 
we need, let's say, a Jewish C.S. Lewis, because now many Jews are saying, not I want to be Jewish, tell me how, but I want to want to be Jewish, but I don't know how, tell me. And so you need writers who will actually explain what does Judaism believe, what does Judaism stand for. The fact is, in orthodoxy, in much of orthodoxy, the main focus has been on the question of, I want to be Jewish, tell me how. And that's the explosion of texts about halacha. And this was ably documented by my cousin, by Dr. Chaim Soloveitchik in his famous piece, A Rupture and Reconstruction. But I don't know if I would call that atheological. And it is rather, uh, as Chaim ended the article, and he diagnosed this you know, really beautifully and brilliantly, first of all, it, in part, we have to recognize that that is part of orthodoxy's strength. Because if orthodoxy is vibrant, in part it's because of their... It, it, straight halachic focus. There is a certain strength and vitality to that. Um, but at the same time, it is, uh, I think Chaim ended off the article, something like um, having lost the feel of God's embrace, they now seek solace in the comfort of his yoke. Something like that. Um, the focus on halacha and orthodoxy comes with one big theological acceptance. And that is Torah Misinai, a faith in Chazal, a faith in the normativity of the Jewish tradition, and of the halachic process. But you're right, I think, that after that major theological acceptance, and I think it is a Kabbalah of a specific theological claim, after that, the question of, who, well, who is this God whose yoke we are accepting? Why is he interested in us? Why is he interested in humanity? Why is he interested in the Jewish people? That question Orthodox Jews aren't really asking and addressing in a, in a, in a, in a really deep and interesting way. On in the non-Orthodox spectrum, and, and on this I would include um, uh, what is now perhaps known as the left of the le in Orthodoxy or the left affiliated with Orthodoxy, um, uh, what's happened is a slightly different aspect. And that is, I think, not not necessarily a full secularization, because there are many people in, those, in the seminaries there who still may be religious, or to use the word you mentioned, spiritual, uh, at least. Um, but what has ended, I think, is a belief, a belief in capital T truth itself. Uh, if you want to write theology in a way that will convince people who want to want to be Jewish but don't know how, you have to make the case, I think, that this is what Judaism believes. This is why it's more true and better than other worldviews. Um, so that already implies a, a, uh, a notion of truth, of theological truth, um, that um, I think most Jews, even Jews who, who are rabbis, uh, uh, most Jews uh, on the spectrum beyond orthodoxy, um, or even those affiliated on the left part of those affiliated with orthodoxy, I'm not sure all of them believe that. Uh, and to do something really interesting theologically, you have to begin with that belief, I think. I actually think that uh, <laughs> neither of us is a sociologist or a demographer, but the question of Speak whether, yourself, right? but whether, <laughs> whether, in the end, um, whether in the end it's not atheological, I think is a really interesting question. Yeah. And that is, in my conversations both with young adults in the Orthodox world um, and with Orthodox congregational rabbis, I'm not so sure you're right, meaning I think Yesh v'yesh, right? There are some and there are some. I think there, there definitely are people for whom the discourse of obligation, of like, what are my chiyuvim, right, replaces um, or allows one to evade the difficult metaphysical questions about which they're lost. Well, um, so, you know, yeah. that, I, I don't think you can simply say, oh, that all begins with a theological acceptance of ol malchut shamayim, of the yoke of heaven. I, I, I really don't see that. Yeah, I think, I, I would also say yesh for yesh, and I think the two can feed on each other. Uh, you know, there's a wonderful comment from Nitziv on the up, you know, on an upcoming parsha, with, you know, with, you know, on Vayat Hanan, where God says, you know, you'll do all these mitzvot, and everyone will admire the Jews for doing these mitzvot. And then he says, you know, Raki Shama Lachash Mor just don't be careful, lest you forget the day you stood before me at Sinai. And Nitziv points out it should be the reverse. Don't forget the day you stood before me at Sinai. And then you'll come to keep the halakha, and everyone will admire you. And he notes in a very sharp point that often the very process of halakha can focus only on action. It can actually lead us to forget the very divine commander behind these commandments. 
Nevertheless, if you take Chaim's diagnosis, um, and in large part I do, I think um, the, the explosion of the focus on halacha has been a certain solace in the yoke of God. Uh, and one that I think is actually quite good in many respects. Uh, Chaim in the article doesn't actually say it's bad. He's just diagnosing it. Um, so I think for many there is this theological acceptance. But beyond that, I think we agree they're not asking some of the larger questions. I think whether there's been a triumph, a total triumph of the secularization project in the modern Orthodox world or in the left wing side of the modern Orthodox community, I think unequivocally there's been an emptying out of, of theology from one institution in modernity that, that used to play a very different role, and that is the university. And I think here, you know, one could do no, no better than cite Alistair McIntyre, you know, Catholic mm-hmm. philosopher, in his book God, Philosophy, and Universities, where he makes the claim that once upon a time, universities had a mandate to see theology as an organizing principle. The different disciplines that compete naturally in the marketplace of ideas had to have some way of adjudicating differences, had to have some way of communicating in in a language that wasn't incommensurable. And theology did that. And you could look at the history of American liberal arts colleges and see the earliest colleges were all designed for this purpose, training the vocation of ministers. But there was this theological conception. The total banishment of God talk from the university today, from the modern secular university, um, affects our view of, of not just theology, but how we look at the world. Theology is not just doctrines about God, but it's a worldview, nature, reality, being, human, otherness, personhood. Um, what, what in this modern moment that we're in um, allows us to put that back into, um, into the discourse and to put it in a different way, what would a university look like that did not banish God and God's presence, not just as the object of, of critical study, but as a real live presence what would such a university look like for, for our intellectual um, being? You know, it's interesting. I often think back on a moment I had. I was about 23. Um, I was in rabbinical school, and I, I decided to audit a philosophy seminar at Columbia on human rights theory. And it was taught by a prominent student of John Rawls. And the first day, he basically lectured on his syllabus, the way some academics speak up a little bit. Um, he basically lectured on his syllabus, as some professors seem to think it's good to do in the first class, <laughs> talk about what he wanted to accomplish. And at the end of that class, I, um, I raised my hand and I said, totally innocently, I said, you know, I'm curious whether at any point in this term we're going to have any conversations about religious traditions and their relationship to potential internalization of human rights discourse. And he said something that, to be honest, it took, me, it took a few weeks till it really registered with me then. But its absurdity has stayed with me ever since. He said, no, we're not going to talk about religions here because we're talking a language that's universal. And I thought to myself a few weeks later, wow, like, that is the illusion of the Enlightenment project right there. Right? Mm-hmm. Meaning you're going to convince the world of radical Islam by arguing based on Kant rather than the Quran. I wish you lots of luck. <laughs> you're going to convince, you know, the most. You're going to convince Yitzhak Ginsburg, right, that we don't hate people because actually, really, if you read Rousseau, it would open up his world. I mean, that's just absurd, right? And what it is, ironically, is on some level the forcing of a particular form of particularity that obliterates all other forms of, of particularity. So I, I think, you know. A university where there is space for um, religious people to be not just objects of study, but also speaking in the first person. So I think there are some very difficult questions here that I don't really know how to answer. But um, the, the, the fantasy that there is some universal language that can make religion irrelevant um, is precisely an illusion. It reminds me of you know, Peter Berger. Um, 
probably one of the great sociologists of the 20th century, who was, um, in his early phase of his career, really one of the great living theorists of secularization, who then led in sociology um, the recanting, right, and saying we were totally wrong about secularization. And in his inimitably witty style, he says, the reason we were all wrong is that all of us in the field of the social sciences confused tenured academics on the East Coast with humans, right? <laughs> we thought that because none of us believed in God anymore, therefore everyone else would catch up and we'd all be secular. And little did we realize that we're basically talking about a very thin slice, by the way, in which Jews are overrepresented, not coincidentally to this conversation, <laughs> right? right? A very thin slice of the human race who are in so many fundamental ways not representative. So I think there's something actually um, really important there. I think the Jewish issue, and here I run the risk of incurring the wrath of every professor of Jewish studies on the planet, but you know, I'm going to say this anyway. I think in the American Jewish community, part of the illness is in that all we do is endow more chairs in Jewish studies in universities, as if the University of Kansas needs to have seven chairs in Jewish studies, and you can't afford to send any kids to day school anymore. So I've been saying to donors, you know what, instead of endowing another chair, endow with day school principalship. If you're actually in this for your Jewish identity, which is what most of you are in it for, you're not in this for the, you know, the perpetuation of Wissenschaft des Judentum, right? You're not, that's not what you're about. You don't even know what that is, right? So is it possible that maybe you yourself have bought into a totally secularized narrative where Judaism is something to be, Judaism is something to be studied only objectively? Um, and might you want to invest in a conversation where Judaism is engaged in and embraced existentially. And that's not about what a university would look like, but that is about what a Jewish community that took Torah as a, well, let's, let's say this in semi-secularized language, as a body of literature that makes some claim on me, as an inheritor of it. And then if you want to move to more traditional language, if you take Torah as Torah, right, then, you know, building more and more Jewish studies programs is actually, completely unhelpful to the project of actually figuring out what it would mean to be Jewish in a meaningful way in America. I said that too strongly. It's not completely irrelevant. It is not the wisest, most directly compelling way to begin to address this problem. Thank you. Yeah, I think the modern university today, um, with exceptions, and I've met significant professors who are just in my own experience, who are exceptions to this, even if their views are secular, uh, but who are open uh, to religion. But um, at the heart of it, uh, I think there are, there are certain doctrines uh, in the mindset of the modern university today that are not just contradictory to, but hostile to certain notions at the heart of religious traditions. Uh, many of these are things that McIntyre himself has documented. Um, the first one is the notion that the past binds you uh, and helps determine your identity. Right? Surely there is no uh, notion more taken for granted at the modern university than the notion that you can be whatever you want to be. The notion that a tradition or, or who your parents were obligates you to them because right? God forbid you should owe anything to the people who are paying $300,000 for you to go to this university. Um, uh, uh, that itself is, is bigoted. Uh, Shlomo Karbuk had this story about when he was visiting a modern university, and he saw the religious students that were there, like trying to find religious students. So he said, when somebody came up to me and said, I'm a Catholic, I know that's a Catholic. When somebody came to me and said, I'm a Protestant, I know that's a Protestant. When somebody came to me and said, I'm just a human being, then I knew that was a Jew. Um, and the point is that in the modern university, there is something uh, deeply hostile to certain things that are the premise of Judaism, certainly, but of any traditional faith, which is that you are a part of a certain tradition. Um, and that that tradition obligates you not to accept things blindly, but to engage, feel obligated to engage. Uh, and perhaps even to define your identity in response to that tradition. That's something that modern university has, has rejected. And I would just say, again, building on what I said before, that modern university has by and large rejected truth itself. Um, if the university now was an enlightenment project, 
right? If this was, you know, if the university now was like what even Rousseau or um, that's God checking out. I'm out. <laughs> right. um, yeah, it's God calling. It's God calling. The phone off. It's, God no in it's God in search of Rabbi Hal. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I would, I, if there was an enlightenment uh, university, I would be, uh, if it, I, would, I would make a Yom Tava Um because, uh, because the enlightenment was first and foremost. That's about, a good thing. About, yeah, that's a good thing, right. Yom Tava is a, is a Talmudic phrase. It means the rabbinic version of partying, uh, <laughs> which is a lot more nerdy than your version, trust me on this. Um, Speak for yourself. It basically, it basically involves making, here, it basically involves making a seum. <laughs> Woohoo! Right? And now, if you really want to get wild, you start another Masechet. Okay. So, this is way too much of a portrait of your right. inner life. I think exactly. we should stop now. <laughs> well, we're just getting That's started. That's very wise. Um, um, but, um, you know, I, I don't think... Uh, David Brooks wrote an article 20, 25 years ago. Uh, in the Atlantic, in the Atlantic, about his experience of Yale, he went to visit Yale. Forgot the organization kid, I think it was called. And um, you know, he went to University of Chicago um, in, let's say, the seventies. Um, you know, and their school motto. I'm from Chicago. Anybody here from University of Chicago? Yeah. Okay. So, what's the school motto of University of Chicago? Chris uh, Katsayensha Vita Excalibur. Let knowledge grow and grow in life and proof. Right. That's. I mean, it's official model. The official model. Right. 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 They're not there to find the truth. You know, they're there to get a degree and go work at Goldman. Mm -hmm. um, that's what he basically discovered. And then he wrote an article recently saying maybe that's changed a little bit, post 9-11, etc. But by and large, um, that's the other aspect of the university. It's atheology because it denies certain notions at the heart of religious tradition. It's, atheo it's atheological <coughs> because it's hostile, I think, to the very notion of capital truth. And again, with exceptions, because I know of important exceptions. And it's atheological because it's just atheological. <coughs> Most students aren't there for ideas. Um, what would a university look like? Um, leaving aside a religious university, meaning we're not talking about a yeshiva or a, uh, um, a, Wheaton, a Wheaton College or a Catholic university. Um, the best we can hope for now, um, because it's never going to become a religious university anymore, uh, even though all their mottos are religious by and large. Um, uh, <coughs> the best we can hope for, I think, is for at least some of the students to critically examine how faith and its faith tradition critically impacted and perhaps <coughs> not just influenced were the primary factor in some of the great achievements of the West. Um, how the Bible was critical. Um, I think that's the most we can hope for. Quick follow-up. I think that the last thing you said requires a fair bit of nuancing, because what I could imagine an august, respected Jewish studies professor saying to someone who just said what you said is, well, wait a second. <coughs> One of the things the university does to young adults from traditional religious communities is ask them to give up dogma and actually explore using all of the lenses made available by right. academics, questions of truth, <coughs> right? To say, right, universities have no interest in truth when you forbid most orthodox kids from taking a course in Bible criticism is paradoxical at least. And by the way, there's <coughs> a tremendous consequence of that because a lot of those kids, right, when they discover that being told it's forbidden to read those books is not compelling in the culture of university, I think it's more complicated because I think there are ways in which, um, there are ways in which it is totally true, right? We live in a postmodern university, not an enlightenment university. Right. There are ways in which that is definitely true. And yet, there are ways in which religious communities encourage young adults to be afraid of avenues that may introduce them to truths that they find, <coughs> let's say, less than salutary for their <coughs> religious commitment. So I think it's a little more complicated than that narrative presents. Yeah, I mean, 
Uh, maybe, but I'm not sure. I mean, the truth is, I don't know that anyone, most of them aren't running around forbidding uh, Orthodox students to take courses. I, I would say, if you asked me, right, what makes me most nervous about Orthodox students going to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, my main concern is not that they're going to be, you know, walking into a Bible criticism course right, with a yarmulke and coming out without a yarmulke. I'm actually not that worried about that. If you ask me what concerns me more greatly, the um, sexual hedonism in mod the modern university and um, the lack of basic moral no uh, rejection of traditional moral norms, or Bible criticism, I take the former hands down. Hands down. I don't, I'm not scared of, of the Bible criticism class as I'm doing the faith of multitudes of Orthodox children. That said, I would say that it is true that Orthodox, that universities ask religious students to question what is true. What is true, or, but another way of putting it would be it's, it's there to show them what they believe is true is not, but not necessarily to show them what they think is true. And I would add, a I think, polemical what the, formulation. Sure, okay. sure, but 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 what was lost at the university is the notion that faith and reason can go hand in hand in the search for truth. Right? Every, every, uh, almost every um, classical or great university, if you look at their original motto, right, stated something like that. The, the Yale was translated Urim Vitumim Lux et Veritas, light and truth, not because that's necessarily what Urim Vitumim means, but because that's what they thought they were attempting to do. Light is reason, and Tumim, right, was revealed truth. And they thought that the two could work hand in hand, that the two can be partners. That was certainly at the heart of much of the achievements of, of, of Catholic thought uh, as well. Um, and I think that is, you know, when when... When Marie Joseph Soloveitchik talks about the majesty of man and the humility of man, what he means by that is, is that man is most great when he, not when he denies his powers of intellect and of reason and of seeking the truth, but of combining that with the humility that comes with faith. You know, my favorite, one of my favorite stories was when Yisrael Alman, uh, the game theorist at Hebrew University, uh, was given uh, the Nobel Prize in economics, right? And uh, he was told that when he arrived, when he was, when he was, when he was, uh, he, you know, he had to bring his whole family, obviously, he had to bring the whole mishpacha when you win the Nobel Prize. And, he's like, and he has like 30 children and a million grandchildren. I'm exaggerating, but only slightly. Um, and he was told that everybody who's attending has to wear uh, you know, a tails and a tuxedo. Uh, and he realized, of course, that that might be a problem because the tuxedos that they would be provided in Sweden might have shotness, right? They might have wool and linen, and you're not allowed to wear wool and linen in the same garment. So we had, like, the chief rabbi of Sweden, <coughs> and they did have shotness, so instead they had to buy tuxedos in Israel, which makes sense, because Israel is known as a source of formal wear. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, the most amazing thing is, is that shotness for the sages is this paradigmatic chok. It's a rule that we keep, not because we understand it, but despite the fact that we cannot understand it. And this is a guy, as the writers point out, pointed out, this is a guy who's being awarded the Nobel Prize for what he's achieved with his mind. The name of his center at EU is called the Center for Rationality. <laughs> That's the name of his center. He's being awarded the Nobel Prize, not some fake Nobel Prize that anyone can win, like the Nobel Peace Prize, a real Nobel Prize, right? <laughs> He's being given the Nobel Prize in economics, right? Um, and yet here he is, about to be awarded for achieving his mind, and yet he's humbling his mind. He's, a, he's achieving an award from a king for what he's achieved with his mind. He's humbling his mind before the king of kings. That's the motto... Columbia uh, graduates here or students? Sure. Columbia students? Larry. Well, Larry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Larry. What is the <laughs> school motto of Columbia in the Latin? Right, exactly. In Lumine Tua we Davimus Lumen, which is Tehillim, the Orcha Nira Or, by your light, God, we will see light. And they believe that faith is a <coughs> handmaiden of reason and vice versa. And that, I think, would be the true, recovering that would be what a truly theological university should one of the dimensions of modern theology is its love of narrative and its distancing from theory in some sense. Um, that might be the, the trajectory of, of modern thought more broadly, but you both had an incredible 
privilege to study with or study deeply as the objects of your inquiry two of those great theological minds of the 20th century. In your case, Rabbi Held, of course, Abraham Joshua Heschel. In your case, Rabbi Soloveitchik, it was Michael Wishagrod. What do these two thinkers have to contribute specifically to our moment that other theologians, other thinkers missed? And, and where were each of them, in some sense, if you can offer this, where may they have missed something in their own inquiry? Okay. Uh, I'm glad to go. Uh, I'm delighted to address that. Um, so Michael Wishaglad, who many of you may not have heard of or know of, um, is an Orthodox Jewish theologian um, uh, whose works I discovered, ironically, originally not within Orthodoxy, but by reading First Things. Uh, which is largely a Catholic magazine, though. It's Rabbi Gottlieb, actually, who introduced me to the magazine. Um, and then I, I got his book from the library, and from the YU library, um, and it changed my life. Um, and there's a lot to say about, about what he believes. What he has to offer, I think, is the following. Um, uh, he basically makes the point that if you want to address Jewish theology, if you want to talk about what Jews believe, you have to begin with chosenness. And either you can defend it or you can't, but you have to recognize how controversial an idea it is. And you have to recognize that if we're to, t to take Tanakh and its word, then Judaism rises and falls with that doctrine. So either it's true that there is a God who falls in love with a particular people and therefore chooses that people, or the ancestor of that people, and therefore chooses that people to play a more important role in the history of the world than any other nation and to be the vehicle by which that God is known to the rest of the world. <clears throat> or it's not true. Now, this is a controversial notion for two reasons. First, for many modernists or postmodernists, it seems unjust that a, a truly good God should love preferentially. He should love a particular people more. On the other hand, for many Jews, including many religious Jews, it seems controversial to speak of God as being in love. And the notion that love is an emotion, surely emotion, is something is a, is a weakness. Um, so it's a controversial idea from two different aspects. But that's what Judaism believes. Um, and uh, um, either you can defend that or you can't. I think you can't. Now what did he miss? This is actually something where Rabbi Held has actually been uh, uh, of great instruction to me. Because Rabbi Held wrote a, actually a, quite a wonderful uh, essay in the Harvard Theological Review on the, I think, uh, I forgot where it was. Modern Judaism. Modern Judaism. Um, on, on Michael Wishaglad. Um, and and he, he basically pointed out the following. And I'm indebted to him for this. He said that if you read Michael Wishaglad, Michael Wishaglad would say, well, why do I believe that God loves the people of Israel? Um, why do I believe that he's in love with them? Why do I believe in a God who's hurt when the people of Israel abandon him? <coughs> why am I speaking so provocatively about God? And he'll say, well, that's what the Bible says. And any other approach to Judaism is just an attempt to reinterpret the Bible. And Wishagrod calls himself uh, a Jewish Barthian, uh, citing the, uh, the great Protestant theologian Karl Barth, um, who very much believed that uh, scripture speaks directly to us, and you don't need the medium of philosophy to. So it is the anti it is uh, Barth is Wishagrod's Christian inspiration, you might say, to be anti maimonidean what Rahel basically pointed out on his piece is he said, well, that's all very well and good, but can an Orthodox Jew really do that? I mean, doesn't Orthodoxy begin with the notion that we read the Bible through the lens of a mediated tradition? You can't just pick up the Tanakh. Protestants can believe that. But Orthodox Jews don't believe that. Right. The way that I put that is, I think, if I may interrupt for one second, sure. is that I'll be the authority Judaism. about what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Judaism is yeah. ultimately, in this sense, deeply Catholic. And the insistence that its hero can be a neo-Orthodox Protestant theologian makes right. no sense. Right, this is, I, that, and it was beautifully put. And, and Does that, do people know what I mean by that? 
that the Catholic tradition, sorry, I just realized I just said sure. that. The Catholic tradition. He's saying is, Judaism is Catholic. That's what he's saying. Exactly. <laughs> we've got it. Yeah. We've got the quote. We have it on tape. Yeah, we've exactly. got the video. Exactly. YouTube, Twitter, exactly. Instagram. Exactly. exactly. Mass will be at 5 o'clock. Yeah, exactly. No, I, 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 um, <laughs> okay, ultimately, 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 uh, yeah. ultimately, yeah. ultimately yeah. Catholicism yeah. Um, operates on the assumption that we read with a whole tradition of reading. Right. And the notion of going back to the source and bypassing thousands of years of reading, which we might call the Protestant impulse, right, is deeply foreign to Catholicism. It is, it is in its nature anti-Catholic, right. and it is also anti-rabbinic. Right. And I, I, I think that's exactly right. And uh, actually, there's a w wonderful story where, uh, where uh, Wyshegrad met Karl Barth uh, in Switzerland. And, you know, he told Karl Barth, you know, I consider myself a Jewish Barthian, which I thought was very funny. And Karl Barth said to him, he said, well, you know, we do, he says, we believe, I believe, said Karl Barth as a Christian dealer, that you Jews have the promise of God, but we Christians have the fulfillment. And Wishakrat said, well, with all due respect, as a Jewish Barthian, right, who just reads Tanakh, right, uh, when God makes a promise, it's like money in the bank. A human being makes a promise, he can get sick, he can renege on his promise. But if God promises something, he's going to do it. So if we Jews have the promise, then we have the fulfillment. If we don't have the fulfillment, then we can't have the promise. And there's a silence. And then Karl Barth says, you know, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, but the truth is... Keep in mind, that's we should graduate retelling. Right, exactly. <laughs> but, that's mediated through tradition. Right? <laughs> uh, but um, but I think it is it is it is a criticism of Wishingrad that is that is I think right, um, and the truth is that it's actually attack that Wishingrad takes that I don't think he needs to take, because if you're picking, you know, if you're trying to say well whose picture of God is more Chazalian, meaning which picture of God is more in line with the tradition with which Orthodoxy identifies first and foremost. The rabbinic literature of the of the sages and Agadah is Jewish theology. It is Jewish theology. Mm -hmm. It has to be the foundation of Jewish theology. So is that more like the picture of the loving, angry, hurt God, the God who suffers with Kal Yisrael, that we see in Tanakh? Is the is the rabbinic picture more like that, or is it more like the Maimonidean Aristotelian God? I think the former. So you can actually argue for Wishagrad's view of who God is and for the chosenness of the Jewish people, which I haven't defended, but has to be, has to be. So that can be for a fear of the discussion. Not by avoiding the rabbinic corpus and the mediation through which uh, the Bible is read, but actually by founding it directly on that. They held. Um, I think that one of the things that Heschel was able to do um, in some ways more powerfully than any other Jew in the modern world. That is like a very dramatic statement, but I, I think I, you'll see what I mean in a minute, um, was to recognize the extent to which secularized Western human beings had so lost access to the transcendent that what Heschel did very consciously was try to <coughs> evoke an awareness, a glimmer, a faint possibility of something transcendent in people that had, again, all but completely lost it. I think it's one of the ways that Heschel is often misunderstood. People will often say, in the people who are in the business of dismissing Heschel, will often say, oh, he's a poet, not a theologian, or poet, not a philosopher. And I think Heschel very clearly would have insisted, you don't understand what I'm doing. Right? Um, I am a poet partially in service of my understanding what theology requires today. That is, I can't argue you into a sense of the transcendent. I might be able to evoke it in you if I happen to be one of the most eloquent writers, you know, pretty much of my century, right? Heschel could not speak English at all until he was about 28, 29, which is sort of crazy to think about, right? I, I could not in my 30s learn how to ask for ketchup in German. Right? And he writes what he does. It's like an astonishing thing. But the, the, the point of the attempt to re-evoke that which has been totally lost is something that I think Heschel identifies as the urgent religious task and that he does um, basically better than anybody else. 
um, if, I, if we're going to use Christian theology here, that's an example of what the great Catholic theologian Karl Rahner called mystagogy. That is, that the task of a theologian in a secularized modernity is not just to make an argument about theology, but to sort of open a portal for people to a reality that they might not otherwise be able to sense. That was really, at the end of the day, um, Heschel's genius. Um, now, I would say that he did something else that I think is very powerful, um, even as it also has its dangers, but I think it's actually extremely powerful. In, in the world in which people had driven a wedge between ethics on the one hand, ethical obligation on the one hand, and a profound focus on the service of God on the other, Babudat Hashem, Heschel was the great bridger of that, um, you know, in philosophical language, you could call that the anthropocentric theocentric divide, right? The, he, he bridges that in everything he tries to do by insisting, overall, I think he's right on this point, even though, as with any sweeping claim like this, there are always footnotes you could offer, that in the end, right, to really worship the God of the Bible, and especially the God of the prophets that he's so focused on, um, is no matter how inconvenient it is to be pushed to love and care and seek justice for those who are oppressed and downtrodden, right? And that the bifurcation, that, and this is a classic American Jewish divide, those who care about theology and spirituality and those who talk about social justice. I remember many years ago, Forward had a headline. Hebrew Union College was looking for a new president. It was probably about 15 years ago. Two of the two final candidates, one of them was saying, we need to return um, to Torah, 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 Torah. And the other one said, my agenda as a president of HUC will be to be the proud bearer of the tradition of the quest for social justice. And the forward's headline was, Reform Face Choice, mm. God or Social Justice. <laughs> Which I imagine, you know, Heschel, like, doing triad amitim on himself just so he can, like, throw himself off a bridge, right? I mean, the appallingness of that distinction. Uh, by the way, this captured very beautifully in Sefer Dvarim, in, in the 10th chapter of Sefer Dvarim, Perak Yud, where, right, God is described, right? What is God's greatness? Ha'el, ha'gadol, ha'gibor, v'hanurah, familiar words, right? The great, the awesome, the mighty God. Ohev ger lo lechem v'simla, who loves the stranger. Verse 18. Verse 19, v'av temeta ger. And you also should love the stranger. Love of the stranger, love of the abandoned, love of the vulnerable is in varim imitatio dei. It is walking in God's ways. It is the imitation of God. And Heschel was really the great voice about this. And he's very insistent. He does not want this to be secularized. He says at one point, I'm probably quoting this a little wrong, but he says at one point in the prophet something like, his book, The Prophets, that is. Um, he, in fact, did not write a book in The Prophets. Um, he, he says at one point, um, the prophets did not care about social justice. They cared profoundly about God, who cared profoundly about social justice. And it was always, it's profoundly theocentric all the way down. It is totally focused on the God who pushes us to care um, in ways we otherwise would not. Now, in terms of what he misses, I want to say that Heschel comes down, and I think it's one of the ways that he's misunderstood. He comes down, um, I think, on a really interesting side of a basic theological dilemma. Christian theology in the 20th century has this basic fight, a fault line, you could say, that runs through it. You have those people who say, theology has to begin by talking about human experience. Because if you don't start by talking about human experience, you have no way of getting people interested in what theology is talking about, right? You have to open some portal, some window in human experience that makes the question of God and revelation interesting, right? On the other pole, there's people like Karl Barth who say, no, theology is, begins with the data of revelation. And if you begin with human experience, you're not talking about revelation. You're actually starting with human experience, and you're talking about yourself in some way. Now, this debate is, I mean, it really is the fault line in 20th century Christian thought. The weakness of the, the beginning with experience position, which is often called liberal theology, but I don't like using that term because liberal has all these <coughs> multifarious meanings. It means liberal as opposed to neo-orthodox. The danger of liberal theology is that it begins with something so universal that it never manages to ground the irreducible necessity of a particularity. Right? Said in English, Right? If you begin by talking about something that is held, experienced by, perceived by all human beings, do you, and if so, how do you, ever get to the point where this particular story, this particular revelation is necessary? As opposed to, 
you open up the possibility of being religious generically, and then you choose. Right? That's the shortcoming of liberal theology. The shortcoming of the neo-orthodox project is you say, here's what God demands. And I say, that's nice. I couldn't imagine a less interesting question. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? Paul Tillich wonderfully says about reading Karl Barth is like having stones thrown at you. <laughs> right? Here's what God said. And I'm saying, that's funny. I was just eating lunch. What are you talking about? Right? Now, Heschel is very much on that liberal side. Mm -hmm. He believes that the only way he's going to get Jews, also Western human beings broadly, but Jews in particular, interested in theology, is by starting with something that is available to them in their human nature. The danger of that is, right, can he ever do a good enough job of grounding the irreducible necessity of Torah as opposed to of religion? I don't think that was a personal existential struggle for him at all. But I think philosophically, that's the danger. But I suspect that that was taken on consciously because he thought the other danger was too vast, right? To just, to just talk like Karl Barth, or for that matter, in a lot of ways, like Michael Wyshegrad, is to run the risk that people read you and think you're talking Martian. And that's, that, I think, is being honest about every theological path you take has a very powerful benefit to it and also a very real cost. And I think Heschel really bears that cost. The response to that, though, would be, I mean, it's so interesting because that's something that always bothered me about Heschel. Um, the response to that would be, if this move of focusing on human experience of the transcendent rather than on the particularism of revelation is motivated by the, by the, um, by what he thought was, let's say, the spiritual starvation that was taking place in America at the time, let's say. Um, the larger question, though, would be still, if you frame it this way, if you describe God this way, in more of these generalities, is it really true to the God that you claim to describe? Meaning, which of God's question would be, the God in the Bible, which, as you say, Heschel definitely believed, right? Is he a God in search of man? Or is he a God who's passionately in love with Israel? I think um, Heschel's answer to that is yes. Right, but where do we see the form? <laughs> right, but where do we... But, 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 you know, from Lech Lecha on, right, and... Spoiler alert, that's like kind of toward the beginning of the book, right? Um, you know, God is pretty focused on this particular people. And all the other people, are they're, in, they're part of the story, but all within the context of the, of, of the vehicle of Israel. There is no, most of it after that is not, you can find me in wonder, etc., etc. Meaning, yes, that's there, but it's mostly, you will find me in this concrete people. Um... And the second question I would ask, because I'm interested in your thoughts on this, is, is in the end, if that was the bet he made, if it was, if it was a strategy, I know you're not reducing it to a strategy, but if, if, if it's in part a strategy, does that, looking back now, um, what endures? Meaning, is it more the particularism that endures? Or is it... The, the more generalities of transcendent or of sensitivity to the transcendent that endures. You mean what endures as a philosophical project or what endures among American Jews? Among American Jews. So, to your first point, you know, I think a lot depends on how you choose to read Tanakh. In the sense that, yes, you can say um, that from Genesis 12 on, um, God is primarily focused um, on Jewish people, although also extremely concerned to warn them about ugly forms of triumphalism that might emerge from that. Sure. Um, you can also say, well, that's interesting. Before the Torah even begins to talk about the Jewish people, it goes out of its way in the most dramatic way possible to insist on God's radical concern with the universal. Um, John Levinson, um, my teacher and I think it's fair to say nobody's idea of a social liberal, right? Because I think it's important in this context. John Levinson argues quite beautifully in an essay of his um, <coughs> that Breshit goes out of its way to begin with what he calls the universal horizon of biblical particularism, right? The universal horizon of biblical particularism is about, if you were to read, let's say, the Babylonian creation story, the Enuma Elish, the Enuma Elish culminates with the creation of a particular place, right? and a particular person, the king of Babylon. 
And the Torah consciously rejects that, right? It's an astonishing thing in the ancient Near East to tell a story of origins that the people telling the story are not part of. Does that make sense what I just said? The people telling the story, that is to say, let's say this in more philosophical language, that the Torah begins with a claim that Israel is not primordial. Neither the people of Israel nor the land of Israel. That's a very conscious choice. It's a repudiation of a kind of hyper-particularity that leaves no room for anything else. I think it is true that Tanakh is primarily focused on God's relation to the Jewish people. It doesn't take, you know, graduate degree in biblical studies to realize that, right? But I think we should not understate how much, how important it is to Torah to begin with a claim about God's relationship to the human. And as for God in search of man or God in love with Israel, I think Heschel would have said, well, it's interesting because the first moment um, of encounter in that way is a moment in which God says, Ayeka, where are you? By the way, all of the whole notion of God in search of man is a riff on that word, right? Which is itself derived from a reading of Tanakh, right? So actually, I think Heschel would argue in part his universalism is not just the methodological piece I just said. His universalism is in part derived from a very serious reading of, uh, of Breshit. Now, in terms of what endures for Heschel, that's a very complicated question because I would say that, you know, in very different ways, something I think about a lot. I actually thought about writing a book about this, but I already have enough people who, you know, have issues with things that I say. But <laughs> Ruff Cook. Rav Soloveitchik and Rabbi Heschel, all three of them, in very different ways, managed to elicit legacies in which people with antithetically different views insist that they are the only ones who know how to read it. Right? So David Hartman and Herschel Schachter can insist that they both have more or less. I mean, that's actually, David Hartman's maybe not a good example of, by the end of his life, but in an early phase of his life. Right? No, uh, th my reading of, of Rabbi Soloveitchik is important. Kierkegaard is really important, and Kierkegaard is like window dressing. Right? Um, by the way, afterwards, I'm going to tell you who's right in each of those debates, right? <laughs> and then, then you have, you know, the rough cook, Svi Yehuda or Avi Ravitsky. Right? Take your pick, right? They're both pretty well versed in rough cook's writing. D sorry, am I speaking a short end that I should explain? Ultimately, a certain kind of ideological. Um, what would you say? I think it's fine. I think it's fine. <laughs> and in Heschel's case. <laughs> interest of time. In Heschel's case, in Heschel's case, it's, it's a complicated piece because, um, you know, you also had. There was about politics. You had the, you know, Michael Lerner and David Novak both insisting that they are the great disciples and heirs of Abraham Joshua Heschel. That's just odd. Right? <laughs> um, I think what endures in a lot of these people, I don't think it's the only thing that endures. I don't, Khalil, I want to be, you know, what endures is how plastic their legacies are, um, how much they're able to be read. I, it is true that in a radically secularized American Jewish community, very often people quote Heschel in popular ways. It is about a secularized mandate to social justice. Among people who think about religion, I'm not sure that's true. I think it's more complicated. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just add that I think, in general, it's, I think it's hard, even almost impossible, to, to not read the opening part of Tanakh and see simultaneously, obviously, God's concern for humanity and that universalistic aspect, but then also get the notion that it's not just that we begin with universal to show as universal and now on to, to the Jews, but the Jews are very much plan B in the sense that... Plan B which has to reflect back on commitment A. Of course, but that said, but one in which that universalism without particularism can never work. So much so that even the universal eschatological vision is one in which not a la John Lennon, there's no countries and everyone, right? It's, 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 it's a radically, right, it's a radically particularistic notion, even if it's in its universal, from Migdal Bavel on. And so for something so basic to Tanakh and to the uniqueness of the Jewish version in contrast to the Christian version, that's what, at least in my more limited exposure, that's what I find missing. So, uh, there. I'm not allowed to respond. <laughs> okay, great. You can respond. No, no, I, I, I would just say, you know, it's a strange thing to say <coughs> that someone who is totally preoccupied with Torah and mitzvot right. and who wants to ground everything he says in Jewish sources right. um, doesn't take that particularity no, seriously. That's I'm, what, not sure no, what that's, that I'm not saying that's what bothers me. That, to me, is the question, right? Meaning, 
how can somebody who, who on the one hand, so uh, this is that is the question, right? You know, it's sort of just like when, I mean, this is, a, I mean, in a very different way, but um, well, let, let's just say this: it, it, someone who, on the one hand, right, the, the God of the Tanakh, right, it's so real to him, and and the Judaism, the particularism of Judaism, is just so central to his life, and yet for the God he's presenting to America to be less centered on the people of Israel than he himself is. Um, and I find that paradoxical. You don't want to keep going, so go ahead. No. <laughs> um, I just have one last question before we open to the audience. You, you both in this, in this round touched on this tension between the universal and the particular. Um, one of the things that Wishagrad and Heschel share beyond their anti-Maimonidean metaphysic is a willingness to engage other religions, um, specifically Christianity. It's actually the 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, uh, No Religion is an Island, and Confrontation, which are really in, in dialogue with, with each other, and, and at least you know, the Torah Shabbal Peh tells us so. Um, what, what's the new frontier in, in the Jewish Christian enterprise of, of dialogue and I mean, I think that's New Frontier today. Yeah, beyond what you know, we're 50 years after these seminal documents um, in in Jewish Christian dialogue. Where where do we go from here? Yeah. Well, just in terms of my own work, I see two things. Uh, one is that. Um, <coughs> Traditional, traditional Christians, both in America and even more so in Europe, who feel now more threatened about their future, um, have become fascinated with orthodoxy and particularly with modern orthodoxy. Um, and it's not something you could have necessarily predicted, but it is nevertheless the case. Uh, Yeshiva was visited by 15 car cardinals from Europe. They're the only ones in the base medrash wearing red yarmulkes. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, and, you know, they come in, Europe has trouble getting people to be priests. And here they see hundreds of students sitting and learning an ancient text and an ancient language. <coughs> But what really wowed them, from what I've heard, was their discovery that the people sitting in this base medrash were not all planning to be seminaries, they're not all going to the rabbinate. These people are planning to be doctors, lawyers, accountants, any other jobs we let Jews do, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hedge funds, right. Uh, theologians, right. Uh, Theologians is really a burgeoning. <laughs> I was going to you know, say, exactly. Uh, that's where the real Don't money is. Don't say with that. Means. That's right. That's, the real money. that's where the real money is. Um, and they've become, I mean, you know, so they're fascinated with it. They're especially fascinated now because they believe that the American public square is getting more and more hostile to their views. They see somebody who is on record as believing in the traditional definition of marriage is getting fired from a firm. And then they, their major concern is how can we both be part of the world and yet also have, to be what Rabbi Salvatore called in confrontation, Gervit Toshav, right? to be both apart from and a part of society. So they've become really, I think, and, and if modern orthodoxy has, as it were, an interfaith mission, I think there's a lot of failings in modern orthodoxy. But to the extent that we've done that successfully, I'm not saying everything's fabulous or perfect. I'm not saying that. But to the extent that we have, we have what to teach, I think, the evangelical community and the Catholic community. The correlative of that is, is among all traditional religions, traditional religion, traditional Catholics, evangelicals, Mormon and Orthodox Jews, the next great interfaith movement is religious freedom. There's a huge debate over Hobby Lobby. Um, all you had to do was take a look at the way different religious movements responded to that decision. 
um, with uh, um, basically most of the, again, for lack of a better word, liberal movements. That's a bad word. It helps, right? Um, denouncing the decision. And Orthodox, uh, the major umbrella groups of Orthodoxy, the OU, the RCA, the Aguda, the major umbrella groups of Catholic bishops, evangelicals, Mormons, all celebrating that. <laughs> it's unfortunate when, when this issue becomes a the political dividing point. I'm not happy about it. But in America, it is one now. And it will, uh, it will continue to grow. And that's not good for American society. But it, it will foster, either by necessity or through sincerity, uh, greater bonds between all of these different religious groups. Thank you, Sally. I'll be held. I want to take this question from maybe a different angle. Um, one is there's a sentence in Heschel's essay, No Religion is an Island, that I think is really very important and was meant as a withering critique of American Jewish, the ways that American Jews participated in interfaith and intergroup dialogue. He says at one point, the first prerequisite of interfaith is faith. <laughs> um, by which he meant, um, you know, Jewish Christian dialogue. That's when deeply pious Christians get together with secular Jews <laughs> and have an interfaith dialogue. Right? And there was something about that that he found to be completely bankrupt on many levels and totally unproductive because literally, like, you're basically having an ethnic group talk to a group that's been talking about theology, and they're not actually having a conversation. It's just basically intergroup peace-seeking, which is fine, but then don't call it what it isn't. Um, so I think that's actually very important, and it relates to where we started, which is, you know, in a Jewish community that is um, so atheological, how do we have a conversation <laughs> in a community whose discourse is so profoundly theological? One of the reasons why, to be totally honest, my own personal life, I find myself reading Christian theology so much is they're the ones asking the questions that are important to me. <coughs> right? If I want to know how to spit out watermelon pits on Shabbos, I know which Jews to read. I actually have a whole book. Yeah, on. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> Volume one is watermelon out. Watermelon Shabbat Kehil Chata. Exactly, great. <laughs> great. Amazingly enough, okay. my Haskama is in that book. Now, <laughs> but the only one. That we the, can... the only Haskama, exactly right. <laughs> this says rocks. I don't, I don't know so, this author, but I've seen this picture, and he looks reasonably Jewish. <laughs> Which is amazing, because it's not true. All right, now, exactly. But, but um, <laughs> I'm reading Christian, David reading Christian theology. Yeah, reading theology because at the end of the day, right? If I want to have a conversation, if I want to actually talk about what it means to talk about God in the modern world and what we might mean, to, you know, to do that, um, I don't have a lot of Jews to go to. Um, and so I think, you know, if we want to have a real interfaith dialogue, which means not just intergroup relations and not just rallying together for this political agenda or that, but actually talking about religion, talking about faith, I actually think in some very deep way. Um, that can only happen as Jews themselves engage more deeply um, in theological questions. Um, in terms of the frontier of how that conversation would happen, I think we have reached one very kind of healthy salutary point, I hope this is true, where we can have conversations that are not about eliding differences, um, but actually about drawing them out and talking about them. Right? I would like to have a conversation I mean, I had, in my Chata'ayani Maskir Hayom, when I was young, I remember going to certain interfaith dialogues in which the Christians in the room would ask if we could pray, and then they would only quote prayers which Jesus was not explicitly mentioned, right? Well, according to me much later, if you believe in an eternally begotten son, every time you say God, you're also saying Christ. That's the point. So let's take your theology seriously, and also, right, Let's take ourselves seriously enough that we can talk about it. I want to be able to talk about, you know, I remember a, a Jewish theologian saying to me, but they don't really believe Jesus was God anyway. To which I thought, who's they? <laughs> right? Actually, let's have this conversation where we can talk about why are Trinity and Incarnation a complicated thing for Jews to wrestle with in making sense of Christianity. Right? Why is Jews not accepting the Messiah has come? you know, extremely difficult ad hayom to this very day for you. In other words, I want to have a conversation that's actually a conversation where the starting point is actually a respect of the other person's humanity and integrity, not the illusion that we can make all deep theological differences um, disappear. Um, I think there's another piece. You know, Sally talked about um, religious freedom. 
I think there's something else that's important to talk about in this context, um, which is the ways in which it seems to me that in every cultural context, religion needs to function. And you're not just Torah, but Torah, crucially, as um, critically countercultural. Um, so, for example, one of the things that I've come to believe as, you know, in my own thinking and writing about this is that Judaism does not have, I know this is like a controversial sentence in a lot of quarters, but I do not think one can derive a one-to-one -one correspondence between taking Judaism seriously and believing in a particular economic system. I actually think what it makes much more sense to do as a Jewish philosopher and as a Jewish community is to say that in whatever economic system you find yourself in, to actually articulate what are the moral and spiritual dangers that are attendant to that. So if you're functioning in a socialist country or, God help you, in a communist country, talk about what the damage to freedom is of those kind of, of economic discourses. If you're talking in a, in, a, in a capitalist country, you might also want to talk about the dangers that come from rampant consumerism, the dangers of the radical individualism that weakens social bonds, the illusion that you can be a Catholic and a Randian at the same time, right? You should talk about those issues. Um, and it's very hard because we live in a time when if you even raise those questions, you're you know, somehow you know, given an ideological label and written off. I think much more helpful than saying, this is what Judaism believes. Here's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Early religious Zionists, they all knew what Judaism said was socialism, right? American Jewish economics professors, they all know that what Judaism says is capitalism. I think those are both very simple-minded narratives at the end of the day, right? And the role of Torah in that level is to be critical. Um, and it makes it very hard um, to be in bed with one political ideology or another, right? And that leads me to the last sentence I would like to say about this. I think it is very important. Here, you and I have talked about this. Um, Mark, here I want to return to the Rambam's insistence that politics is in the service of religion and not the other way around, <coughs> right? That the political sphere makes possible avodat Hashem, which is the highest thing a human being can do with his or her life. I am very wary whether it happens on the right or on the left, it happens among both, they become mirrors of each other, of the, of the co-optation of religion to serve a particular political agenda that is at the end the highest political goal. It'll leave it at that. It's a great place to end, Rabbi Held. Uh, okay, thank you both. Uh, we're going to open the floor now. There are lots of questions out there. I'm going to assert the privilege of Alan Rubenstein to get the, <laughs> the first question. Highly inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, tomorrow, I think basically everybody in this room is going to sit down and uh, to have a serious conversation in the spirit of Jewish citizenship about the issue of gay marriage. And we have, on purpose, prepared the, the, that important social topic, at least important within the American political cultural scene, with your panel. Not because we thought your panel was going to be about that, but because it seemed that theological perspectives should be brought to bear, or they should be asked in some way or other through the lens of theology, or could be productively asked through the lens of theology. So I'm curious, and you can help us out if you could each comment on: Is that well, how does how do controversies in Jewish theology impact the way we should, as citizens, and people that have to make judgments and decisions in a democratic polity, orient ourselves to that to that question? Each from your own. So just to clarify, Alan, you're not asking about the particular policy issue, the, the articles in the packet. No, I'm asking about you're just uh, methodologically as as a question of approach orientation. Is it theology, or does that, does that question that we have to ask as citizens and as Jewish citizens have anything to do with theology or not? Uh -huh. yeah, right. oh, sure. Uh, look, there is no question that it has. The question has a lot to do with theology, um, just as every controversial moral question in society has a great deal to do. With and a traditional approach to this, uh, which uh, require a lengthy discussion and actually was the focus of an entirely different uh, Tikva seminar that just finished, uh, would require a discussion uh, in which both Christians and Jews engage in talking about, uh, to go back to the universal passages that they held us. What does it mean when God creates man and woman in his image? In which way do man and woman differently image God? In which way does marriage between man and woman uniquely 
embody uh, God-likeness uh, in the way that nothing else can. That's where theology would come in. There. That said, uh, in traditional Judaism, this is uh, part of an important moral tradition and halachic tradition uh, that's universal, uh, but goes far beyond theology uh, and uh, touches on halacha, on notions of universal halacha, on halacha itself, and, and from there on to public policy and to many other other subjects, uh, which are critical subjects, um, but a bit beyond the purview of this particular panel. Um, I'll say three things, none of which are directly your question, but all come at it from an angle. One is that despite everything we've said about this being an atheological time, I think it's important to keep in mind that every time a Jewish leader takes um, a public policy position in the name of Judaism, whatever that means exactly to them, um, or for that matter, issues a psak halakha, they are also, consciously or not, implicitly doing theology because they are making a claim about who the God they worship is. Um, you can read that in very different ways, right? You can imagine that in your particular case, you know, whatever. You, I, I'm not sure I want to go down this route, but I, you know, right? You would imagine, okay, I'm going to talk about this God, and I'm also, you probably wouldn't say this, implicitly affirming a God who is uncompassionate and cruel, or a God who is in favor of moral dissoluteness. I don't really care at this moment what the exact issue is, but I think it's important to be aware that if you're claiming to speak in the name of religion, you can't escape theology. You can only convince yourself that you're escaping it. Because the way you think a tradition speaks to a modern moral question, the way it affects human lives, is a theological claim. I'm happy to flesh this out later more explicitly if that's necessary, but I hope it's actually not. Um, I also think it's important to say, and here is probably a place where um, Rabbi Soloveitchik and I would disagree in very fundamental ways, I think this is really a profoundly non-Bartian claim. I think that Jewish theology and ethics um, have always and need to continue learning both from the written documents we call Torah and from the lives of Jews and human beings we encounter and we meet. And that on some level, those two things need to be brought in con into conversation. The texts are not just always a trump card or a bludgeon um, for the lives of, of people who are affected by them. Sometimes they actually, the readings get shaped by the stories that we hear. Um, I also think, and this is a conversation we could have a five-hour panel about, because, and to be honest, I'm very ambivalent about what this ought to look like. Um, on the one hand, we want to invite theology into the public sphere. On the other hand, we have to find ways for theologians to talk in ways that those who don't share the assumptions of the theologian doing the talking can at least understand, right? And not feel like all that's really happening, happening is the invocation of a, of a revelation they don't share a commitment to that is used as a bludgeon against their own freedom. That is a very hard issue. That's not, that is, to me, that's not a left or right issue. I actually think the most articulate voice on this in the Jewish community is actually David Novak. That is to say about the aspiration, at least. You could agree with his politics, not agree with his politics, but the aspiration to talk in such a way that the hearer right, doesn't feel like, oh, basically what you're doing is saying, look, I believe in you know, Catholic notions of moral law, so shove it, right? That's just the way it is. You have to find some way that the person who doesn't share all of your philosophical, theological starting points at least understands what you're saying and does not see you as kind of dressing up a bludgeon as something else. That's a very hard issue. If you know the person who's figured out how to do that just right, I really want to meet them because I think it's very difficult. In part, that's why the Novak piece is, is in our packet for tomorrow. It creates a, a language of public rationality or public reason that you may agree or, or, or not, but it's, it's articulated the yearning is so there. that you could have but, the conversation. But I would add, I'm going to just add two things to this. Um, first, I, I mean, I agree with what I said before, that you can't use religion in the service of parliament. So. You know, on the one hand, anyone, you know, and I've actually seen somebody once say, you know, well, Joseph, you know, did a 20% flat tax in Egypt, and that's, you know, a proof of free market economics, you know. Now, I am a free market conservative, but that's, that's ludicrous. On the other hand, the notion that um, the Torah obligates government-mandated health care is, 
is equally ludicrous. Um, you know, and reminds one of the, the joke when somebody comes to Israel and asks the Israeli guy, how do you say tikkun olam in Hebrew, right? Meaning, uh, right, the fact is, it's, it's l'tzakein olam malchut shakai, right? And that is what we're seeking to do. On the other hand, I do think, and I think this is important to agree with what you said, that there are certain things in which both theology and tradition, and ethics, to the extent that that's different than theology and tradition, I'm not, I don't really think it is, but, but to the extent that it is, um, uh, have to make, have to have a say, and 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 for traditional, for members of traditional faith, this is the issue of marriage is linked to a larger biblical worldview that they think is not just what God believes and shove it; it's what has nurtured and sustained Western civilization. And they believe as well that a lot of things about the biblical worldview have nurtured and sustained Western civilization, and that you can't just remove all of that without, uh, you know, and say, well, we could still maintain everything else that's great about it. The question is what the case you make for it is. No, I understand. The, 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 and I agree that how you, the case, how you make the case is important. That said, what you are seeing all too often now is the, the exact opposite, which is... It's not the people of faith who are saying, this is what the Bible says, shove it. It's the people from the other side saying, anyone who believes the traditional notion of marriage is akin to Bob Jones University and is enshrining racism and bigotry uh, into, into your religion at the heart. An actual reporter for the New York Times actually just tweeted, basically, about people who believe traditional notions about these things, uh, about these issues, should be you know, stomped out and... Uh, um, so, when we talk about using words and beliefs as bludgeons, um, we have to have in mind the other side. Yeah, for sure. I think what we have here, by the way, is a pendulum, right? We are more radically, more radically intolerant religious formulations. By the way, this is, I realize this is a chicken and egg question. I'm not trying to assert where the starting point is, okay? But more radically intolerant dogmatic religious formulations elicit more radically intolerant dogmatic anti-religious formulations, the chozer chalila, and it goes onward and onward. I think those things are mirrors of each other, to be sure, right? There is more than enough doctrinaire dogmatism on the political left and on the anti-religious left, to be sure. Um, I just don't think that's the only problem that America faces in terms of integrating religion. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not claiming it is the only one, but it is, it is important. I have two questions. Can people introduce themselves? Yes, sure. If you could just say, your name um, and where okay, you're from. Okay, I'm Frat, um, a summer fellowship student uh, from Israel. Uh, I have two different questions, but uh, they're related. Uh, the first one, you were talking in the beginning of the session about some lack of renewal in the theological uh, world in, in the United States, and I feel that there is a lot of renewal in Israel in that area, and I want to know what do if you agree with that, why do you think it's different? And is it there influences between uh, the two places? And also, the other question is, um, you were describing a lot of different phenomena, uh, current phenomena, about uh, the lives of young Americans and American people, Jewish people. And I want you to know um, specifically, how do you think that it drives from the postmodernism? And also, I think that the Israeli theological has a, world has a lot to say about postmodernism, and how do you think that the state theological? Thank you, Efrat. Uh, that, those are good questions. Um, I think there's a lot of very interesting writing taking place in Israel on all sides. Actually, I would love to see some of the, just some of the deeply theological engagements just within Orthodoxy that are taking place in Israel on Tanakh study. <coughs> and I'm just giving that as one example. I'd love to see that more of that here. Um, but I'm not sure uh, that it's that hard to answer why that's the case there, because um, Tanakh seems very real in Israel, because it's being relived now in another Jewish commonwealth. But as a Jewish commonwealth in which we don't have a Navi, right, you don't need direct, you don't need to sit and write books of theology 
based on your own thoughts, if you have your Miao or your Shayao telling you what God wants, right? That's sweet, right? You just go to him, right? And he gives you Jewish theology. Um, um, and I would add that there is a, there is a, this is at the heart of Israel, and it's what it's grappling with theologically right now. I was actually just having, this is our conversation before. Uh, to be an Israeli um, is to be grappling with a, a certain tension that lies at the heart of the very story of Israel, which is to some extent a theo it's, it's a tension between theology and, and politics or the mix of the two. It, is the purpose of modern Israel to normalize the Jewish people? Or, or is it to bring about their covenantal and particularistic yearnings? Are linked to Chosenness. And that's that's a tension that was there from the very beginning. Um, uh, <laughs> how does the Israeli Declaration of Independence begin? Eretz Yisrael kam ha'am ha'yehudi, right? According to Jewish theology, is that true? No, probably not, right? So, um, right, they were chosen by God, either in Mesopotamia with Avram or in Mitzrayim. Then they had Sinai. Then they had the land is very important, don't get me wrong. Don't forget the covenant in or, uh, the Moab. The Moab, right, exactly. <laughs> and and Abraham Yardane, exactly. right, Abraham Yardane. But, um, but all before you enter the land. Um, so, on the other hand, so you read Herzl, right? Herzl is all, at least the first Herzl is. I have a great idea. Anti-Semitism is an anachronism like candles in the age of electricity. That's actually his mashal that he uses. I have a great solution. Uh, we'll have a Jewish state, and anti-Semitism will disappear. Done and done. How'd that work out? Um, on the other hand, right, you're struck by his prophetic prescience that this could be, uh, you know, something like this could be achieved. <coughs> so they are living theological questions. Uh, this is a joke I just told to, to somebody who's here, but one of my favorite jokes, which is, was told to me by a secular Israeli, is, is a joke about the Israeli in Yerushalayim who's looking for a, a parking spot for Makom Chanaya. You all know this joke? The Israelis in the room? So, and he can't find it for two hours, so he looks up to, to heaven and he prays for the first time in his life. And he says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if you help me find the Makom Chanaya, and Yishmol Shabbat, and Yishmol Kashrut, right? I'll keep the whole Torah, and immediately a huge truck, right? sitting in his park there, pulls out, right, leaving a huge parking spot, and he immediately looks up and says, Aloha shuv kvar matzati. Never mind, I just found one, you know. Um, uh, to be an Israeli is simultaneously to be living this extraordinary modern achievement, and yet to be a living miracle, right? You are an embodiment of a miracle that just happened right in front of your face, or you are that miracle. So what does that do for you and for how you organize the state? How do you organize your life? Um, there's no more important and central theological question than that. And where better to turn, of course, than to Tanakh? Um, that I think, at least within some segments, on both the left and the right, both a little more secular and, and, and that's you and me. This is, this is where... Um, this is one of the most central questions of our time, and it's inherently theological while being very modern and political and relevant. So, oh, do you want, you want to respond to this too? Briefly. Yeah, so, <laughs> Sally, the memo is we're supposed to talk more briefly, which is... The more questions. <clears throat> I'm, I'm deliberately... You know, you know the two most right? meaningless words an American Jew can say when a rabbi says, in conclusion? Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this is actually over the I didn't say that. becoming a tougher <laughs> crowd. Um, or the jokes are getting worse. Um, I'd actually be fascinated to hear at some point when you say that there is a revival of theology in Israel, who you're talking about. I think there is a revival of interest um, in Jewish learning of all kinds in Israel, a revival of people that we would describe as theologians in the way that we're talking about here. Of Shagar, maybe. Yes. So the funny thing about this conversation is you raise this, and everybody says, Rav Shagar. And then you say, anybody else? Ginsburg for in a different way. Things. Okay. Okay. No, what fair. You, yeah, okay. The point is, I, I think it's fair to say. Um, look, the state of Israel has produced many wonderful things. An array of enduringly important Jewish philosophers we will be reading in fifty years. Mamash Lonireli. Right? It really does not seem to me to be true. Whether that will happen is an interesting question. 
right? It reminds me, 10 years ago, when I used to have conversations with friends, has Israel produced any significant philosopher? It was the same conversation would say, Eli Shvide. You would say, anybody else? They would say, Eli Shvide. Avishai Margalit. Um, yeah, not a Jewish philosopher in the same way. Right, but a okay. Jewish philosopher. <laughs> yes, a Jewish philosopher, right. Okay, my point is only this. I think <laughs> that, the, that what you refer to is really, really, really only at the very, very, very early stages. Um, and we really, I don't, I don't think we know yet what it means. I don't think we know yet what Rav Shagar's theological writing really means, how important it will be over time. It's very important right now in a cultural moment. I'm not in any way Khalilah disparaging. I'm just saying, I don't think we know yet. Like, is Rav Shagar someone we're going to read in 50 years? I don't think we know the answer to that question. Um, it, uh, it, it, it seems to me um, that in some ways Israel faces um, a lot of the same dizziness as American Jews face about, you know, try writing about the God of history after the 20th century in a way that leaves you feeling that you said something coherent, meaningful, and really makes you want to dive in. I mean, you can do that in certain ways, as Tzvi Yehud and his circle did, but you do that by having to say some stuff about the Shoah that might leave you also a little queasy and uncomfortable. You also have philosophical trends in Israel that, for what it's worth, as a philosopher, I find very worrying, right? And it actually goes to something that you talked about earlier. One of the responses that you have among certain is Israeli, let's say, Jewish thought academics, I think this is very rarely put this way, but it is explicitly a response that I would call the theological overconfidence of Tzvi Huda Cook and his circle, is what you have now is the emergence in Israel of post-metaphysical theology, right? Um, fascinatingly, Christians are in the process now of giving that up as tired and outdated, and Jews have discovered it. As always with theology, right? We're 30 years late. So now Jews have discovered theology without metaphysics. I'm not sure personally it made a lot of sense when Christians did it. I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense when Jews do it. What I think it's interesting is as a cultural moment, right? When Yoska Achituv, right, one of the great you know, liberal religious Zionist lions, basically says, you know what? Nim Asli, he calls it. What do you call that? Sionuta Datita Ashlayatit, right? delusional religious Zionism. I'm done with that. So fine, you know what, if I have to, let's not talk about metaphysics at all. Right? Let's just talk about you know, Torah as a discourse about values. I totally understand where that comes from. I'm not sure that's a prescription for theology at a certain point. It's something else. But in 15 years, this will be a much more productive conversation. We'll see what Rav Shagar's students do. Right? We have to wait, I think. I think that some of the major theological questions that we ask that are currently 20 books on Tanakh produced in Israel that address these questions. Using okay. Tanakh's lens in a way, uh, from a very different perspective. So that's a question does. about genre, right? Yeah, well, that's a question that about genre. That will stand the test right. of time. Um, 20 books that will stand the test of time? Well, you are very yeah. confident. Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, it's so much to yeah. Take more questions. Ten of them are written by one author, yeah. but they'll still stand the test of time. My name is uh, Nelson. I, uh, I write for the New York Times for my job, but I'm not the one who tweeted to stomp out <laughs> other people. Thank thing. you. I promise you. Thank you for not trying to, to stomp that. out traditional religious people. <laughs> my, I just actually tweeted to stomp out Solly, but, <laughs> but it wasn't about <laughs> politics. My, That's my, fine. I retweeted that. My question is, I, don't even know what Twitter is. I think you guys, both of you, diagnosed the American Jewish condition very, very well. And I think the problem is the answers of how to address that, how to deal with it. On the left, people either shut down or they speak vaguely of social justice and Darfur, et cetera. On the right, they push traditional Judaism, but they don't practice it themselves. And um, I mean, I've, I, I don't know where my colleague David Brooks Dobbins, but I read his column all about pomegranate, a kosher store in Brooklyn. I'd be surprised if he shopped there. Hey, don't knock pomegranates. Yeah. I took uh, him there. Yeah. So, so the question is, the question is, are I mean, you can push this, but if you're not practicing it, or if you're just shutting down and talking about other subjects, neither of it's working. Is there an approach that would work, that would engage American Jews in what we all agree is a fantastic tradition that we don't want to lose four million people out of six? Yeah, I think. Um, I'm now going to give him a message. Oh, he's getting a lecture now about speaking briefly. Um, I, I, it's a very hard question. On some level, I feel like if I really knew the answer, I had a diagnosis, you know, American jury would be in, in a much healthier place than we, in fact, are. I think you have a diagnosis. It's, the, you, it's good. The cure is the answer. The question is my question. So I want to understand. I'm sorry. Maybe I don't understand your question. Yeah. Your, your question is, what is the cure for what exactly? American Jews being checked out, disengaging, not relating to their own tradition. What I'm saying is, uh, yeah. And how do you bring them back in a way that 
you know, it doesn't seem like the left or the right have the answer. Can I just add to that question? Do, do books like, like Ronald Dworkin or Nagel's Mind in Commos, do, do, do they in any way help the conversation to, that are addressed kind of God religious questions to a secular audience? You know, it's interesting. The question of how do you engage Jews with Jewish tradition, I think that there is a very fine line to walk, and it is often simply ignored. And I'm trying to keep this as brief as I can. This, I mean, each of these questions is like a whole. That's I, your guilty complex. Huh? It seems to me, I would story of my life, my friend. <laughs> I think that um, many people in the liberal Jewish community um, liberal Jewish communities, I don't mean that as a monolith, <clears throat> want very badly to find a way to engage Jewish language to talk about issues that matter in people's lives. And there is a tremendous nobility in that aspiration. The problem is that very often what they come up with is totally self-liquidating Jewishly. You want to know what I mean by that? Self-liquidating Jewishly meaning I had this conversation recently. I was at a conference of day school principals. Um, a scholar resident at this conference. And this woman says to me, um, this, this, I think she's a, a board member of one of the schools. She says, you know, we have given our kids amazing Jewish language for the mandate to recycle. And I said to her, you know what? I actually think there's enormous religious value in recycling. However, right, if that's all you've given them religious language for, Right? That is self-liquidating Jewish theology. That is a set of commitments that in the end they can get elsewhere. If you're not also giving them a language of words like Torah, mitzvot, chiyuv, obligation, I'm sorry, but like their grandkids have no shot. Right? This was not exactly the most popular thing I ever said in that setting, but I think it was very important to point out, meaning the yearning, by the way, and this is where I think Hirof Cook is a very important model. What I did not want to do is say that's ridiculous. I actually wanted to find in a very real way what I actually identify as a really deep Jewish yearning there. And it's a desire to find a way to actually use Jewish words, right? This is actually something I talk about with social justice crowds all the time, Jewish social justice crowds. Don't use the word tikkun olam. For the simple reason, use the words that the Jewish tradition would use for the things you're doing. Teach your kids, by the way, teach your kid to say bikr cholim instead of tikkun olam when they go to a hospital. Now, Bikr Cholim alone is not the prescription for the future of Judaism either. Judaism without Bikr Cholim is a disgrace, right? Visiting. But, hmm? Visiting the sick. Visiting the sick, sorry. Um, so, I, it actually, your question in a very deep way goes to that question about liberal versus neo orthodox theology. Because the attempt to re engage American Jews is a version of liberal theology. It's often not very theological, but it is about an attempt to speak to their human situation. But if it doesn't do the job of actually <coughs> trying to offer them particularity, right? If you don't teach kids why tefillin matter, or I don't care, I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, it's a sentence I didn't mean to say. I don't care about tefillin. But the, no, I mean, I don't care what the particularity is in this moment, right? But if, it, if you don't have real language for why the forms of Jewish religiosity matter, um, you have nothing. Now, what they will say, right, many people engage in this, is if I don't do that first thing first, I can't do the second. To which my only response is, that's fine as long as you're serious about doing the second. I don't see a whole lot of indication that there's seriousness around that. Right? I, I'm not really answering your question. It's a very no, no, hard I, question. Yeah. I think you're at least, at least you're getting what, what's working and what's not working in particular. I, I think right. on the right that that's changing. I mean, I remember, sorry, just very quickly, I remember a, a friend of mine talking about being at a, confer a commentary magazine conference 30 years ago and being overwhelmed by the irony of hearing speaker after speaker talk about the necessity of traditional religion for the future of America. And then as he described it, I'm going over to the salad table and I'm, I'm just trying to find a piece of lettuce that doesn't have seafood on it, right? And I'm like, people, you're not serious. It's totally disingenuous. The whole project is disingenuous. Religion is just being used as a handmaiden to politics. But that wouldn't that happen is not today, us. by Exactly. Way. No, I know. I'm saying both Paul realized that there was a hole at the heart of that project. The question is, can they recover? That requires really engaging the Torah, qua Torah. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. Um, it's a hard question because I think to some extent, I mean, the real solution is to, uh, is to engage in something that to some extent is 
different than the way modern America approaches something. So you mentioned the, uh, the David article on pomegranate. But he actually had a lovely phrase there where he said that, you know, most people in America see life as a, as a journey, and it's like a choose-your-own-adventure, right? You want to do this, you do this, you want to do this, you do this. Um, and he was describing Orthodox Jews, but it's true about a lot of traditional faiths. Uh, describe life as a craft. Um, that you work at it and you, and, and no one claims that it's always easy, um, but a life of command is actually, in a certain way, can be exhilarating and even make you more free. As uh, you were in the article, just as working on piano or any for, other form of music can require exercises, daily exercises, that are rigorous and, at least at first, extremely annoying. Um, but ultimately can give you a richer dimension of life. Um, it's life as a craft. I don't know if anyone saw the... Um, I just got back from Japan. I'll end with this. Uh, did you see the documentary uh, Jiro Dreams of Sushi? Uh, you should watch it. It's available free while streaming on Netflix. Um, um, it's about an 85-year-old uh, sushi maker in Japan, the greatest sushi chef in Japan, who still sees himself as somebody who's constantly perfecting his craft. It's all he's done since he was 17. There's not a single Jew in that movie, and they're eating a heck of a lot of trafe in that movie. <laughs> um, delicious looking treif. Um, but, um, but it's one of the most Jewish things I've seen. Um, and, and I think that's the big question. Can this, David ended the article by saying, I was struck by those people's confidence. Because once dismissed, they now see themselves as the future. And uh, that was somebody who consciously announced saying he's an outsider to this. Are you willing to, to live like that? Are you willing to say that I'm going to make the demands in my life which I will accept even if it will hinder my choices that I want to make in my life? Are you going to say that I'm going to turn down going to Harvard right. because uh, I think this religious university is better for me in terms of developing and honing my religious capacity? Um, that's what makes your questions a deeply important and good one but because we have to recognize the real <coughs> clash uh, that's taking place here. Toby? Tuvi Miller, a member of the Summer Fellowship. Where are you from, Tuvi? From Baltimore. Um, to go back to something Rabbi Held talked about before I asked you just to unpack it a little bit, you posited this relationship between the texts of our tradition and the lives of the people who are, who are living in the present day, and you sort of you alluded to it and then, and then moved on. I'm wondering if you just unpack it a little bit, you flesh it out um, uh, for us. Yeah, I think that at the end of the day, um, I'll say it abstractly again and then try to compress it. We don't just interpret lives based on text, we also interpret text based on lives. And we have no choice but to do that if we're going to read with integrity. Um, I don't know what the answer is about Torah and homosexuality at the end of the day, but I do know that just repeating a set of talking points about what homosexuality means and not actually having conversations with gay people about their lives, their yearning, their aspiration is religiously and morally bankrupt. I'm using that as an example, right? Um, now, that doesn't yield a one-to-one -one correspondence in the sense of therefore it must be saying this. I think what it yields is a sense of much greater complexity and willingness to be humble about always knowing in every situation what it is that God wants from us in this moment about this particular question. Um, it requires a theologian and a posek to do really deep listening when his impulse or her impulse is to scream, or to lecture, or to beat people up. Um, you know, you discover that someone you actually love has this problem or that problem. I mean, the truth is, you know, homosexuality is a very loaded example, obviously, in our culture, but you know, it means thinking about how and whether you apply um, Hilchot Mam Zerut by actually talking to people who have been affected by it. How, it's actually just incorporating the yearnings and the suffering of real people in your thinking about what a Kaddish Baruch Hu is saying in these texts. That requires, I would say, by the way, really profound faith in the goodness and the love of God. Um, 
and, and the insistence that ultimately Judaism is not just an akeda, which has become a very common, just a kind of, you know, just a, which has become a much more common um, motif engaging some social questions in ways I think is ultimately religiously very destructive. Is that clearer? Yes. So my name is Daniel Feinstein. I am from Mexico City. Uh, one of, I have two short comments to make with relation with the situation of theology in America and world. I think that it, what was lacking was the dimension of postmodernity in terms that in the postmodern discourse, there is the end of the grand narratives. And theology is a grand narrative. And part of this, the second point I want to make is that uh, as a professional sociologist that today in the international frameworks of sociology, uh, secularization is considered an ideology that does not reflect the reality of the world. And as Peter Berger we mentioned, but many others speak about the desecularization of the world. And in this sense, it's interesting what said very famous uh, British sociologist, Gracie Davis, which he speaks that what's happening in Britain today is believing without belonging, <coughs> speaking about what's happening with the church. And we could say that as Jews, what we are, we are seeing is belonging without believing, <coughs> connected with what is the erosion of theology. And the third point I want to make, the, all of them I should elaborate, but we don't have time to elaborate, is that today the dominant uh, strength of theology today is Kabbalah. Even in ways that we may not love, but there are thousands of people today in different frameworks, uh, uh, Jews, non-Jews, liberal, orthodox, in, in different areas of Kabbalah, if you take in the Sephardic world, in the Hasidic world, and uh, in this, uh, I don't, uh, maybe that we don't have the discourse that we would like, but Kabbalah today is one of the dominant theologies of Judaism in different ways, many of them very superficial, very distorted, but there are thousands of people in different frameworks looking the, the, the theology of Judaism in different understandings of Kabbalah, and we cannot dismiss this uh, cultural phenomenon. Thank you. <coughs> Abby? Yeah, just make sure it's a, a question. Uh, Abby Dalberstern, hi. Um, yesterday we heard Micha Goodman talk about the problem of many, that many, many people have, um, that their idea of God stops developing um, in second grade. That's what he, he posited. And he said that one of the challenges for us is to figure out how, to, how do we help our own theology, our own beliefs in God develop past that. So I'm curious if you have suggestions. That's a good question. Um, um, very briefly, um, speaking just someone who grew up with a day school experience, I think we can go back to all the midrashim that we first learned as children, and uh, and really attempt to try to understand what are they trying to tell us? Because agada, which we often learn through a very literal lens as children in the Orthodox day school uh, is original Jewish theology. That's first. Second, I actually think that Judaism believes, and this is the link between life and theology, that the best way to understand God is to have children. Um, that's actually a hard thing to say because that's a whole other issue. Of a great source, it could be a great source of pain for some people. But uh, the Jewish focus on children is not a set halachic piece unlinked to its theology. It's the notion that without living the life of father and mother, we cannot fully feel what it means when we say God is father and mother, and God in Tanakh is both father and mother. Um, you know, when Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says, you know, that if you want to see what it's like to be God, you should have kids, because then you know what it's like to create people you can't control. Um, he's saying it as a, as a, as a joke, but it, there's, a very, a joke there's a very profound there's a very profound point, and I think that lies at the heart of Judaism. And we don't often then go back and say, okay, now I'm a father, and I know what it's like to be deeply, to care about somebody else more than I care about myself. I also know how easily hurt I can be if that love is rejected. Now, that's God of Tanakh. Now, what does that say about my picture of God? 
Just two very short thoughts. One is, I think part of it requires talking about theology after second grade. Meaning, uh, right? I mean, you know, one of the things that... Wait, Hashem is not truly everywhere? One, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, uh, I, I, you know, one of the things that I like doing with some people, although it's frightening for others, is actually learning the more Nebuchadnezzar with them. Because the, the guy of the perplex, that is, because one of the things that they discover is the Rambam didn't believe any of those things either. That's so interesting, right? The Rambam thinks a personal God makes no sense. That's what really might even be verging on idolatry. Right? That's crazy stuff. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, right? My seventh grade Chumash teacher was not the last word in Jewish theology. That's a very powerful thing. Like, that sounds so funny, but for most people, especially if you're raised in like Yeshiva Day School, that's literally, uh, certainly for me, that's what I ended up thinking. I remember literally, as a 19-year-old, discovering, I am not kidding, that there was Jewish philosophy, right, after Yimei Abenaim, after the Middle Ages. I didn't know that. No one ever told me that anyone was doing that. That's just sort of shocking. Right? The other thing I just want to say to complicate this picture a little bit is it's always important, I think, to keep in mind that one person's childish faith is another person's most deeply held assumption. Mm -hmm. I, this may you know, reveal something somewhat disturbed about me, but I often imagine Heschel reading Mordechai Kaplan in his inimitably sort of like dismissive way about this, our ancestors believed, and I imagine Heschel banging on the door and saying, who are you calling an ancestor, right? I believe that, right? Our ancestors believed that God communicated something God wanted to us to know about God. Right, that's not our, that's me. I think that's important lest we become sort of dogmatic at the other extreme, right? You know, whenever someone says, modern man can no longer believe no matter what they say, they're lying. <laughs> it makes no difference what the end of that sentence is. It's a lie, right? That's what Peter Berger learned, <clears throat> right? Very profoundly, right? Okay. That was great. Thank, Thank you. you both. Um, <laughs>